Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to our talk today about headaches and migraines. I have Dr. O'Donnell from our neurology department here, and it is Headache and Migraine Awareness Month in June, so that's why we wanted to get together and talk about um, migraines specifically and how they affect kids. So, Dr. O'Donnell, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so let's just dive right in. What is a migraine, and how is it different from just a regular headache? So um, migraines are a very specific type of headache that um, has similar characteristics in most instances. They are a little bit more variable in childhood than they are in adults, but in general, the pain can be one-sided, can be both sides in kids. Um, it's usually though described as pounding, throbbing, or pulsing rather than tight or squeezing, which is more common to the tension headaches. Um, it is sometimes associated with nausea or vomiting, and it can also be associated with some light sensitivity and sound sensitivity. Um, you can have a few of those characteristics in tension and other types of headaches, but those are really classic to migraine. Mm -hmm. And the, the big thing with migraine is that it usually stops you in your tracks. Mm -hmm. It keeps you from doing what you need to do. You know, some of the other headaches you're able to push through. These usually, you know, just get you down for the count, put you in bed in a dark room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what, you know, with kids, when do you typically start seeing kids getting migraines? Is there a certain age that you kind of see that start popping up? Well, migraines tend to increase in the incidence and the prevalence from around age three, even okay. to the mid 20s. Um, and after that, it sort of settles down a bit until like into the 50s. And so a very young patients can be diagnosed. It's harder because you don't yeah. get the details, but some of them can be very articulate. Most often with the young patients though, there's a family history of it. Okay. And so, you know, there's a parent who's had migraine and they watch the child's behavior and they say, oh, this reminds me of how I feel when. Yeah. And that's that's how we are better able to diagnose a very young child who may be having migraine. Okay, interesting. Do we see our migraines at all more typical in boys or girls, or is it kind of the same? You know, up to about the age of 10, it's fairly equal. Okay. Um, once you get into puberty, we start having a few more girls than okay. boys with migraine. Um, in many instances, male patients can outgrow it, you know, so to speak. Yeah. And um, by the age of like 40, it ends up being almost twice as many females as male. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do we know what causes migraines? Um, you know, there's a couple of different ways to answer that. Um, technically and scientifically, there are a lot of things postulated about whether it's, it's vasoconstriction, there's chemical changes in the brain that spread across the brain um, associated with these things. And we, we don't necessarily have all of that nitty gritty detail worked out. Yeah. I think more importantly for patients to know is it's typically inherited. It's almost always a familial situation, but there are triggers that can set them off and you yeah. can exercise some control over those things like sleep deprivation, skipping breakfast, skipping other meals, being dehydrated. So, um, so migraine usually is caused by your genetic makeup. But yeah. Any individual migraine might be caused by one of those kinds of things interfering. Okay. If a parent is trying to help, you know, determine maybe what their child's triggers are, how would they do that? Do you recommend like a headache diary or that kind of stuff? Or how do you get to that? Right. That can be very helpful. So, you know, for things like, you know, sleep deprivation and missing meals, you kind of are able to, to you just know that as a parent that yeah. that's going on. Um, but, you know, for those kids who have maybe some food sensitivities, it's a little harder sometimes to piece together. So when they get a headache, if you can kind of, you know, look at the characteristics at the time, make notes about how did they rest the night before, um, look at what foods they had earlier in the day or the previous day. And, and over time, if you keep track of that and you see one thing keep showing up on your list, then you can kind of become um, more, uh, more aggressive at trying to yeah. avoid that situation. Yeah, absolutely. So I think sometimes people hear of like an aura with a migraine. So what is that? And then how might a parent, you know, because it's hard. It's one thing if you're identifying your own symptoms, right. but how can a parent, you know, know 
or help a child um, articulate if they are having that? Right. So um, the more common ones that most everyone knows about are visual auras, the the scotoma, the the either patchy um, loss of vision or bright lights in the vision, or sometimes sort of a moving um, sort of caterpillar like looking thing across vision. And and kids have a um, have an interesting way sometimes of describing things. So it's not always the easiest. Sometimes if you have yep. them draw a picture okay. of what they see, that can be very helpful. Um, and that's the more common um, type of, of situation, you know, flashing lights, dots, floaters in the vision. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's more elaborate um, and kids can give you some pretty interesting details. I had one patient describe that when they have their headache, their mother's hair always turns into green flame. Oh, and wow. Mother was quite upset that he was, you know, using his imagination. I'm like, no, really, actually, that might be true for him. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it can be very odd. Now, some patients will also, though, have either numbness or tingling on one side of the body. They might even have weakness or dizziness. So there are other types of symptoms that can go along. Okay. So if a so kid if I, is having um, regular headaches and a parent thinks it might be migraines, is it an appropriate question to maybe ask them, hey, is there anything happening in your eye? You know, what are you seeing? That kind of stuff. Right, right. Okay. And, you know, once they've had it a few times and you start to see that pattern, you can start yeah. um, encouraging them to provide information. Did you did you know it was coming? Did you have any sense that you were about to get a headache? Okay. Okay. And and initially, that's always very hard for them to report. But, yeah. you know, parents also then start to see that look in their eye. You know, all parents yeah. say they get dark circles under their eyes. You know, I know when it's coming on, their behavior changes, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how are migraines diagnosed? So basically, it's taking a history. There's not really a blood test. You know, it's okay. not like taking a temperature or doing an x-ray. Um, you really have to get the details of what that specific headache is like and see if you have the classic symptoms that, that go along with it, including light sensitivity, the nausea, the vomiting, the pounding character to the pain. Um, and the family history is really very helpful too. Um, and you know, and we have patients who are adopted, we may not have those details, but many times you get those, those classic details that that patient's having and you can clinch the diagnosis that way. When should a parent seek additional treatment if they're concerned? I mean, I, and I assume that you would recommend starting with their primary care doctor. Um, so I guess that would be my first question of when should you bring it up to your primary care doctor and when might the primary care doctor refer them to you? So um, any headache that's really interfering with your existence, okay. um, want to make note of and have your primary care physician be aware. And if it's something that's happening like, only over the summer when they're overheated and playing really hard out in the sun, you know, that's something that you can work with. If they happen monthly, we don't usually try preventive medication, but if you get into a place where you're starting to have these things occur weekly or more, we would start talking about preventive measures. Okay. And most of our primary care physicians have a, a good comfort zone with um, preventive medications like Periactin or Topamax. Um, if you need to go that far. And if that's not helping, they may refer on to neurology to look at some other options that may be available. Okay. Um, we uh, have completed a co-management um, uh, assessment of treating migraines and we distributed that to a number of the pediatric practices. And it has lists of medications they might use. So our primaries are really very um, knowledgeable from their own exper experience and expertise, but we also now have, you know, shared details okay. of things they can, they can use. Yeah. How often is a migraine, you know, maybe a sign of something worse? I mean, I know that I personally get migraines. It can feel like, I mean, it's horrible. And so you just right. feel like, gosh, is something wrong? And, you know, and I've had them for years, so I'm pretty confident that there's not. But when you first start getting them, you worry. And I think as right. a parent, you might worry, is something else wrong? Right. Um, so how often is it maybe something else wrong or is it usually it's kind of migraines? It's rare. Uh, it's yeah. really quite rare for it to be something more serious, like say a brain tumor. Right. Um, but one of the things that's hard is that, you know, if you have increased intracranial pressure that's causing headache, that can be pulsatile. It can be pounding. Yeah. Um, you can also have nausea and vomiting with that. So some of the symptoms do cross over. And, and that's where it gets a little bit more concerning. If there's no family history of migraine, it makes you really wonder what, what's happening. Okay. Um, and so that's a time we may take a little closer look. 
The other thing is that if headaches are awakening patients in the night, or if they have a headache every morning when they wake up, those are things that are not typical of migraine and may okay. be an indicator of something more serious. Okay. And if you think that it's migraine and it's been being treated for a while, that suddenly things change and it's getting worse, yeah. or if you have any of those neurologic deficits with it, even though some of our migraines can include neurologic deficits, I wouldn't write it off to that right off the okay. bat. If okay. there's weakness on one side of the body, I'd get that checked out quickly. Okay. And my last question is just, what are the best at-home remedies for migraines? So over-the-counter medications really do a nice job in most instances for children with, with migraine, Tylenol and ibuprofen at reasonable doses. Um, you need to be careful and not overuse it. So, you know, again, if you're needing something weekly, we probably should look at a preventive so we don't end up with rebound or medication overuse headaches in addition to the migraine. Um, but those usually do a nice job. Um, and then there are also some um, uh, preventive measures that, that you can take, you know, supplementing with magnesium and vitamin B2 or riboflavin. Those have been shown to be helpful and protective against migraines. So those are easy things that you can do without a prescription. Yeah, great. Was well, there anything I didn't think to ask you that you want to make sure to share today? I don't think so. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I think this has been really helpful. So um, thank you for all of you who have watched. And if you have additional questions, you can feel free to put them in the comments um, on social media and we will answer them. So thank you so much, Dr. O'Donnell. Thank you.